Good morning from Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Donfrey with GMF, and a warm welcome to all of you for to joining us for this conversation about an oasis in the desert, Turkish tech companies. This online event is part of the series organized by GMF and TOG, the Union of Chambers and Commodity Exchanges of Turkey. And my thanks go to our wonderful GMF TOG fellow, Kadri Tostin, and my colleagues at GMF's Ankara office for organizing this event. GMF has been covering Turkey extensively for decades. But if I'm honest, we've missed the tech scene. Today, while Turkey faces significant challenges, whether we're focused on domestic politics, on the economy, or on foreign policy, but the Turkish startup market is thriving. We can look to the success stories of Turkish tech companies acquired by international venture capital companies at high price tags. And what certainly caught my eye recently was the acquisition of Istanbul-based Peak Games by the gaming giant Zynga for $1.8 million. That represents the first billion dollar plus exit for a startup in Turkey. Turkey's market size, its young population, its human capital have played important roles in that development. But a key question that we wanna probe in this conversation today is how Turkey can sustain that success and carry it forward. To answer that question, we need to understand the main factors behind the success of Turkey's tech companies. We need to understand what Turkey's comparative advantages are in this market and what challenges Turkey will need to overcome to sustain this trend. We could not have three better panelists to help us understand this all of them are gurus on tech innovation and entrepreneurship. I am going to introduce them briefly, though their resumes are much more extensive than what I can share with you. We have Chris Schroeder, who most importantly is a member of GMF's board of trustees. When he's not doing that, he invests in tech startups around the globe through Next Billion Ventures, among other funds. He was CEO of WashingtonPost.com and an entrepreneur co-funding HealthCentral.com backed by Sequoia Capital that was sold in 2012. He wrote the best-selling book, Startup Rising, The Entrepreneurial Revolution, Remaking the Middle East. And I have read it and can highly recommend it. Along with Chris, we are joined on the panel by Didem Altop. She is the founder and managing director of Endeavor Turkey, a role she played for 12 years, creating Endeavor Turkey as a catalyst for mobilizing high impact entrepreneur ecosystem in Turkey. She has a background in technology centric management consulting and business development. And she has over 20 years of experience in advancing corporate social responsibility civil society and community building across numerous domains from education, civic engagement and women's empowerment to innovation, entrepreneurship and venture capital. And last but definitely not least, we have Aurora Belfrog sitting in Stockholm. She is partner and co-founder in Sustecable, which is a platform for technology that addresses sustainability. She's a senior advisor at the geopolitical risk firm Concilio. And fun fact, from 2014 to 2016, she traveled around the Middle East and North Africa and hosted a show using humor to talk about the hardship of building a tech company that she called Saluting the Naive and Crazy. So you can see we've got a great trio. And the plan for our time together is I want to turn to these three for brief opening remarks to see the conversation we're going to have as a group. I'm going to then ask a few questions of my own, and then I'm going to open it to all of you who are tuning in. So I want to encourage you right now to start thinking about those questions you want to ask. 
use the Q&A button on Zoom to send those questions into me and I will do my very best to weave as many of them into the conversation as possible. So with that, I am first going to pass the baton to Chris Schroeder to kick us off and set the table. Chris, over to you. Fantastic, Karen, and it's a complete honor to be here on this uh, wonderful discussion, but it really is an honor to be on the board. Uh, there's no group that I'm more thrilled by or honored to work with, and you've just been an amazing leader of it. So I'm thrilled, and I salute also the amazing team doing the work that is so central in Turkey right now with GMF and its partners, which I think is, could not be more important in this time. Uh, GMF, I think overall in this time of COVID has had amazing webinars that have talked a lot about today, but also a lot about the future with this amazing GMF dose of realism of our times, but always paths of how new futures can come. And uh, today I, thought, I hope we are in that tradition because it's so powerful. I will also note that there are no two people on earth who understand what's happening in Turkey and the tech scene better than Didem and Aurora. So what I'm gonna do is step back for a couple of minutes and just give a global perspective. Before COVID, I would fly 250, 300,000 miles a year to many emerging markets in many places, pulling together the theses. And now of course it's on Zoom. But everywhere that I go, I'm asked, what is the greatest trend in technology today? And like anyone on this call, we can talk a little bit about AI and genomics and 5G and other things that are coming. But I think actually the most powerful tech trend today is not the tech itself, but it's the near universal access to it. So 60, 70, 80% of humanity is walking around with a smart device in their pocket. And a smart device, of course, is a supercomputer. Each device has more computing power than all of NASA had in 1969 to put a man on the moon. And what is exciting is all that access isn't just about the smartphones right now, but almost every new technology tool, uh, machine learning, Google AI, there are all these platforms where entrepreneurs can access the best of the latest technology because of the access that they have uh, to smart devices in a very, very powerful, powerful way. And so what happens is around the globe, people are building unique data sets that are making their unique ideas come to fruition with greater precision and greater competitive advantage overall. In combination of all of this, almost overnight, it's like 3 billion consumers appeared around uh, particularly emerging markets, but around the globe. And they want products and services on their terms. They're not looking for the one-stop shop Americans to come in. And that was the American playbook. Like for years, if everyone had access to a smart device, all that meant is if Facebook showed up or if Twitter showed up or if Instagram showed up, the Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram would be those companies. But now local and regional understanding is becoming incredibly important and people don't just want one kind of idea. They want an idea that's relevant to their market and relevant to their region or relevant to whatever dynamics that matter to them. And that can come from anywhere. China, of course, is exhibit A for all of this, what has happened within China, but now also in these other new globalism, as I describe what's happening in the rest of the world, is incredible. But it's not just the story about China, right? There are small Chinas rising everywhere. Uh, a lot of people in America have never heard of Grab, but it is the largest ride-sharing company in Southeast Asia that for all intents and purposes, um, Uber had to exit the region because they beat them. We never would have talked about that 10 years ago. Kareem in the Middle East is the number one ride-sharing company that Uber acquired because they couldn't beat them because they had a great management team and really local understanding. But they also were worried that the Chinese competitor might come in to buy them. We wouldn't have talked about that 10 years ago. The greatest e-commerce company in Latin America is not Amazon, it's Mercado Libre, and we could go on with these examples. I think the thing that I keep seeing on the ground overall is that this is a bottom-up phenomenon. When everyone has access to this kind of technology, you're unleashing talent everywhere, and people are seeing what other people are doing out there and are being inspired to build things in such powerful ways. And possibly in all of this, COVID has accelerated all of it. Because you know, lots of people were starting to buy things online and so on, but COVID made it a necessity. We're now literally in six months, hundreds of millions of people who might have taken a decade to get comfortable buying things online, having things delivered online, getting mobile money, getting access to credit, taking courses, validate that my, as a job, I'm willing to hire someone who takes a digital course, the empowerment that comes with actually talking to a doctor in the privacy of your own bedroom. Like all of a sudden, 10 years of behavior kind of shifted there and that's the beginning of acceleration because new technology is always coming we will have 5g in the next couple of years and that will be a compounding acceleration even behind that and so it's a remarkable era at one level and obviously at the same time it raises enormous questions that we have to navigate all of us as society and as investors overall all this tech is wonderful but it also means that bad actors can do bad things with it and it means governments who so choose can repress with it right 
Um, I have seen something that I never would have predicted, which is really kind of a balkanization of technology, right? There's an internet of America, and now there's kind of an internet of China. There was always an internet of Iran. And I'm seeing even in Europe discussions about how the internet can be sort of split apart, whereas I always thought it could be one massive thing that could raise talent to benefit everybody overall. And perhaps the biggest thing that I worry about is that the digital divide is now more serious than ever. Everybody doesn't have access to what I described. In fact, for all the billions that do, perhaps two billions of our fellow women and men in around the world have no access at all. And effectively, we're saying, sure, you can join the economy, but you can't go on a road. That's what we're effectively saying to somebody who doesn't have access. So the issues are very real. And with all of this, I then turn to briefly to Turkey, and it's vexing to me. Because at one level, Turkey is just a magnificent country, and I love it so much, and it's all there. You have a large market of 100 million people, as Karen mentioned. There's been steady economic growth despite many, many challenges there. The average age, as she, uh, Karen pointed out, is 30, and they're all kind of digitally native in what they do. The country kicks out 52,000 engineers a year who are world-class engineers, and they're six, a sixth of the cost of a similarly talented engineer in the United States of America. And yet, it feels like it's been punching below its weight. There's something like three or four hundred billion dollars of venture capital spent every year. And obviously, U.S., China and India take a lot of it. But still, the amount that is being deployed in Turkey is still way tinier, I think, than it should be. And there have been these amazing economic events like Yemisebiki, which is an amazing food delivery business that got bought for six hundred million. And Trendyol, which is an e-commerce uh, fashion company, got a seven hundred fifty million dollar effectively acquisition of Alibaba of, you know, coming from China. But they're not a lot to point to. Except now Karen raises exactly the right point. This summer, Peak Games gets acquired for a massive number. And Peak Games is a great Turkish story that became a great European story that became a global story. And for me, I think that's a wake-up call. If it's not just a wake-up call, at least it's a reminder of all the positive factors that I've described overall. Is it truly a mark of a new future? My general view, and I really can't wait to hear the other women talk about it, is it's a matter of choice. Because while the phenomenon I've described is very bottom-up, the top down matters. And if government is willing to do the kinds of step as many governments around the world are to unleash this talent, to keep the talent wanting to stay and succeed in the country, we're talking about something very exciting out of Turkey. If that's not the choice, um, it's gonna be very, very curious as to where things go. So hope that is helpful. That's really helpful, Chris. And I think that the point you made about the interaction between these bottom up developments and top-down developments, and particularly what COVID as an accelerator of existing trends means today, the interaction among those dynamics is something we definitely want to dig into later in the conversation. Thanks for kicking us off. Didem, I'd love to hear your perspective. Let me unmute myself. Thank you, Chris. That was such a great setup. I feel like we're playing tennis. Let's see if we can keep the ball going, the volley going. Um, I, I, I agree with everything that Chris has shared. And of course, he, he did a wonderful job of outlining the, especially the highlights. I just think that it's a matter of perspective too. I mean, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Turkey literally is 15 years old. Like I can point to the day. Um, and, you know, I will, I'll tell, take you on a little journey of what happened actually 15 years ago. Well, in 2003, we lobbied to get Endeavor to launch Endeavor Turkey, which is a worldwide organization supporting high impact entrepreneurs in emerging markets. For three years at that point, we had to lobby with the like the big business community leaders and they, their first instinct was, why would I be supporting new companies that may compete with me, right? So they weren't necessarily very entrepreneurial friendly to begin with. It took us three years to convince them that it was in their vested interest to be, to be championing this entrepreneurship ecosystem sphere. And then in 2006, we started with eight business community leaders across a bunch of diversified um, industries. And then with them, we recruited 24 mentors who were all like C-level subject matter experts, maybe people from the investment community. And with that small community of like 32 people, we launched Endeavor Turkey. With those people, then we started recruiting the low hanging fruit, the up and coming entrepreneurs. So the Yemek Sepitiz of the world was one of our first entrepreneurs that actually became an Endeavor Fellow. When the mentors started working with the entrepreneurs, they got excited. 
Um, they got excited about what could happen, what the potential was, et cetera, and their mindset started shifting. The, the entrepreneurs themselves became, created a role model effect to attract more entrepreneurs into the space. The mentors started a role model effect, attracting more mentors into the space. And very quickly, we saw that the mentors were evolving now into also potential investors. So this is literally the birth of an ecosystem that's, that's happened 15 years ago. It started with a handful of people, attracted the, a small group of entrepreneurs, and then together they started the snowball effect. And at the time, you have to remember that none of the language, none of the lingo existed. So in a place where anything describing high impact entrepreneurship, the venture capital community, the whole world of the entrepreneurial mindset, if the words don't exist, the behavior doesn't exist. And if the behavior doesn't exist, then the attitudes don't exist. So we're really talking about much more than just diving into technology and creating some value. We're talking about a mental paradigm shift in the way we do business and what's a reputable career choice and um, do you want your recent son or daughter who graduated from university to join a startup company kind of a thing. Uh, so we had the mentors, then we started getting the entrepreneurs. Together we started building out an investment community. And then of course um, we started also working on pipeline and that's when the education and some of the corporations started getting involved. So right now today at least half of the universities, at least 100 universities out of 200, now have entrepreneurship programs and incubation centers and accelerator programs. But again, 15 years ago, there wasn't even one. So all of this is happening again in the last 15 years. Again, on the government policy side, they incentivized uh, the launch of an, a chain of technology parks to support research and development, innovation and entrepreneurship. And, Again, that went from zero to 70 in the last 15 years. Government policy has actually been on paper, at least, quite, quite significant and noteworthy. There are lots of incentives, grant programs, tax incentives. Um, and in fact, as a research and development hub, it's very advantageous to be based in Turkey for the talents. And then maybe the sixth shareholder in this whole community was the media. So media started really becoming a partner in building the whole local ecos ecosystem as well. Not only dedicated media like WebRazi uh, and e and platforms, but media overall started, started paying attention to what was happening in this space. At the, when you think about those 15 years, it would have been, I, the, the challenge of course is that you have a young population you have to create jobs. The pace of technology is coming upon you like a tsunami. Like you either have to adapt or get crushed. So the, that wave of entrepreneurship and the first wave of early adopters is quite significant. The exciting thing, I guess, as a turning point today is, is that the corona, corona and the pandemic really did catalyze um, the notion that this entrepreneurial mindset has to evolve faster and actually it's no longer a luxury to have it, to adopt an entrepreneurial mindset it's a must-have um, so for corporations and companies and SMEs everybody is going through this digital transformation it's here to stay so everybody's becoming a little bit more entrepreneur savvy let's say um, and even beyond the normal angel investor networks and the venture capitals capital groups, we're seeing a whole wave of corporate venture capital also um, being deployed right now, which is quite exciting. When it comes to really leveraging the talent, like the advantages of Turkey, let's say we have the talent pool, which is phenomenal. In fact, it's not just phenomenal for Turkish entrepreneurs. We're seeing more and more European and Middle Eastern entrepreneurs want, look exploring the Turkish market as a potential hub for both research and development and project management. So we have more companies now coming in, even though some of our entrepreneurs, some of our engineers are leaving, other companies are coming to Turkey to take advantage of that talent pool. The ge geographic location is undeniable. Um, the number of suppliers are, are undeniable. So between the, the diversity of the suppliers in Turkey for any type of business that you want to do, and then the geographical reach uh, in terms of logistics, um, you have huge advantages. And of course, on the consumer side, there is a tech savvy generation. 
and GSM penetration is very significant. Um, but the big obstacle then, I guess, is really aligning goals and mission. Like there's no clear strat strategic direction in terms of where we're going to build our competitive strengths and our muscles. Um, you see countries like France declaring that they're going to be the, the, the pioneer of the green movement of, of uh, climate, climate uh, change companies and research and development. Germany is doing their own um, agenda setting as well. As a country, we don't necessarily have a specific policy in terms of where we want to become competitive and keep growing. So if you try to do everything, then sometimes you end up doing nothing. And that's the problem. We've seen really dedicated, wonderful um, success stories in the e-commerce space, um, as you mentioned, Yemek Sepete, et cetera. In FinTech, we've always been a spearhead in the banking sector and in the financial industry sector. That's growing really well as well. Gaming, esports are also coming. And those are areas where um, it just makes sense probably from a talent pool and from a marketplace point of view. But in, from a more systematic point of view, I, I don't necessarily think that we have a, an, a specific strategy as a country. You know, and that was really helpful because you helped us understand the road Turkey has traveled over the past 15 years and then really highlighted the challenges that just played so nicely off of the, the comments that Chris had opened with. Yeah. And now I'd like to bring Aurora in. Over to you. Thanks, Aurora. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. This is uh, uh, an honor and, and, and a very exciting market uh, and a, an exciting region. So I'm, I'm proud that we're here talking about it uh, in this context. I come from a slightly different angle, which is um, some sort of the European entrepreneur and the European investor. So with a different mindset, looking at the opportunity and hopefully I can uh, highlight that angle and why uh, it is uh, exciting from uh, a traditional entrepreneurship point of view. As you mentioned, I did a, a show around the region uh, for, for two years. My, uh, my father's a, a diplomat and uh, I was, grew up in Saudi Arabia and I uh, proudly call myself a wannabe Middle Easterner and a wannabe Turk. So everything that I've done professionally has been driven by uh, a personal desire to be in the region, meet the people and an obsession for aubergine. Chris and I met uh, during this time and he's seen this obsession for aubergine live. So everything has been an excuse uh, to, to eat more aubergine. So please follow my blog, I Aubergine, uh, which is mostly about tech, actually. But what happened was um, I'd built a company in the traditional Silicon Valley startup uh, ecosystem, raised lots of money, a fintech business. The founder of LinkedIn, uh, Reid Hoffman, was an early investor. Uh, the founder of Skype, Nicholas Sandstrom, was an early investor. Um, and we moved to the Valley, et cetera, et cetera. And after uh, leaving that business operationally, I was approached at a dinner party. Someone said, what does the tech scene look like in the Middle East? You're always there. And I just never put my two worlds together. Immediately Googled and realized what you guys already knew, what an exciting scene it was. Um, all over the whole, the, the MENA region, um, which led me then to, to start a, a show where we addressed the hardship of building companies. And because I had built a, a company and I had all the, the uh, what Didem was talking about, I had the lingo, I had the language, and we had done the, the Silicon Valley success story. But what comes with that and what everyone knows is it's a series of, uh, of embarrassing, painful mistakes before you get anywhere. And I wanted to address the, par the embarrassing, painful mistakes because it's such a key part of building a business. And in, a, in an immature ecosystem, you haven't come to that bit yet where you start being honest about how hard it is. So what we did was a show where we, uh, I exposed my jugular and I basically told all this, the stories that, uh, 
that made the audience laugh because they knew it was true, they'd done it themselves, which allowed us to have um, an honest conversation together with the, the local startups, the local VCs, the local incubators, but also media and academia, shifting the conversation slightly towards uh, a more helpful ecosystem. Because what Didim was saying, if you don't know the startup scene, it sounds insignificant ecosystem, mentors, coaching, mindset, the right words, but it's absolutely crucial for it to happen. Uh, and I have to do uh, the, the shout out to Endeavor, both in Turkey, but uh, in all the countries throughout the region, you've really set the framework allowing for the successes that we talk about. And it's, it's, it's a, usually a very ungrateful job that you've done. And on that, it's the other shout out, which is to Chris, because when I came to the region to 2014, Christopher Schroeder's book had just come out, 2013. Oh. And basically, I was the only European and Chris was the only American actually traveling around uh, as some sort of mini celebrities, uh, highlighting the opportunity and what was happening and, and who was doing what, which was fun for us. And uh, you put the region on the market. But it's also quite sad, but from a financial point of view, it's a huge opportunity. So there's so much going on and everything that Chris and Didim was saying in terms of the talent, the young population, the understanding of technology, the access to it, the talent that comes out of the universities is still relatively uncovered. So from a VC, a European or US VC uh, perspective, uh, there's there's opportunity there and speaking to the local VCs uh, I was talking to my friends at 212 uh, who covered the, the Turkish market uh, and, and the broader region how surprisingly little international capital is reaping the fruits of the opportunities there which is great for them but obviously there there's more to be done and I think I think it's good that we're having this conversation uh, with you because I'm assuming, maybe incorrectly, but uh, given from your, from your intro, Karen, that tech has not maybe been top priority for institutions like yourselves, which means that you've, you might be assessing the market from a, a strictly geopolitical, political uh, macro perspective. But if you look at it from a financial venture capital point of view or an angel point of view or even a private equity point of view um, and uh, do the calculations financially, then the opportunity is huge because the, the, the add on to this, which is the trend that I've seen over the course from 2014 when I got involved until now, is that the additional mindset change. When I was looking at the market 2014-2015, it was still calculating the, t the size of the Turkish market because what uh, any entrepreneur or investor knows, you will look at the size of your opportunity. 300,000 people, 300 million people, etc., cetera, uh, selling uh, a goods to, to a B2B or a B2C market. But because of the political risks of the region, the, the mindset has now shifted. So many of the Turkish entrepreneurs are now seeing Turkey as a test market not as a home market, not looking at it from a 300 million point of view, uh, but looking at it as a test opportunity in a, an interesting market and then leaping internationally. Again, from a VC point of view, making Turkey super exciting because it has what we have in Sweden, which is then a small insignificant market where you just test and you go global. So uh, my, I'm getting more and more excited about the opportunities in Turkey. And I can talk about this forever. So I'm going to stop here and then uh, allow us to, to talk about it together as a group. Fantastic. And thank you for that, Aurora. You really did bring this interesting ex perspective as a European entrepreneur and investor that complemented so nicely what Chris and Didem said. And I want to first pick up on a point that Didem made and first draw you out on that. And, and then Aurora and Chris may also have thoughts on this. Um, you know, Didem, you clearly had an insight 15 years ago that that was the moment to move in Turkey on these issues. And I'm really interested in that. I mean, what was it that led you 
to start Endeavor Turkey and knowing what you knew, having the experience you had at that time, what made you think, I'm going to do this in Turkey and I think there's some chance it will be successful? I mean, 15 years later, you can look back and say, wow, that was the moment and this took off. But yeah. what led you to think it was the moment 15 years ago? Uh, well, honestly, I'm born and raised in the United States, and I came to Turkey working in the technology space as a management consultant. So I've always been involved in technology. Um, I actually started thinking about this space, and I, I studied, I actually focused on entrepreneurship while I was studying at Carnegie Mellon. Um, but I started thinking about opportunities in entrepreneurship in 1999 for Turkey, and it was so premature. It super online, Turk, the Turkcell. The GSM operators had gotten really powerful and really big, and they started an, an incubator called Super Online. Um, we started, I started an incubator in 1999, but it was so premature. Um, and then in 2003, we started lobbying about it around Endeavor, actually. And for me, it was actually, I was doing um, consultancy on corporate social responsibility uh, in that field. And everyone kept asking me what was the next big social issue that they should be paying attention to. And I kept saying, it's going to be the pace of technology, youth unemployment, etc. cetera. The, the fastest way to create high quality jobs is by supporting entrepreneurship. Um, and then in 2004, I think that the turning point was that uh, internet access became residential. Like up until then it was only for businesses and it was still dial, on, dial up, but in 2004, not only did we go into fiber, but we also went into residential access to internet. So that was a big turning point, I think. And now you had this infrastructure, but there was no content. So everybody needed to create some type of content or value added services on top of that infrastructure. So you could see that it was coming. Um, everybody could see that it was coming, but it hadn't been kind of organized. So it was a really interesting kind of turning point, I suppose. So you really gave structure to those. Yeah. And, and I think it also helped that we were independent, right? So like if any one company at that time had tried to spearhead something, it might have been a little bit territorial and people would have stepped on each other's toes. It was interesting that we could come in as this independent organization and say, hey, this is too big for any one organization to do alone. It needs to be a collective action. And we brought in, you know, diversified industry and multiple multiple stakeholders for example typically you won't have you know five different banks sitting on the same board of directors but we did we had three universities sitting on this board of directors you know executive board but we did we, we had every single you know consultancy you could think of becoming part of the mentor network so um it wasn't just a oh you know Pricewaterhouse is working with you, so KPMG won't join. Everybody was involved. And we were really able to mobilize the entire, you know, private sector community as part of a movement. Mm -hmm. So, Aura, I want to bring you in here because one of the things that I'm thinking about is everybody around the world thinks of Silicon Valley as the exemplar of startups, tech, entrepreneurship. And one of the things that often comes up is different cultures. And, and you have this perspective that spans the Middle East, North Africa, but also Europe. And I, I had this flash as you were talking to Bavaria in Germany. So the state of Bavaria, one of its slogans is laptops and lederhosen, trying to capture both tradition of lederhosen, but the tech movement they want to be part of, the laptops piece, right? And I was in Munich at one point and this official in Bavaria said to me, um, oh, Karen, we're so proud of our startups. You know, 90% of our startups succeed. And I was like, well, th that's not a good statistic. <laughs> I mean, really, 90% of them should going to be bankrupt. And that But there was a real, I mean, certainly in Germany, there's still a culture that it's not cool to go bankrupt. That's embarrassing. And it's hard to find venture capital for some of these things. So Aurora, talk a little bit about cultural differences. And is there anything in the Turkish special sauce that makes it a place where startups can thrive? There's two elements to, to the cultural uh, alignment 
and differences. And I think we've touched upon it in different ways here today, but one shouldn't forget that what's built in Silicon Valley uh, jokingly can be called a sect and it's a circus and there's a specific lingo around that circus um, and that that buzzword uh, glossary allows you to speak the same language which means that your lederhosen entrepreneurs uh, the, the the girls in Cairo Istanbul Stockholm London roughly speak the same language and that might sound insignificant but because the pools of capital are still not as uh, dispersed as the uh, entrepreneurship talent. A lot of the capital comes from, from, from similar places. They, and I'm now going to be rude, uh, and you can call me up, up on it if you want to, but the generalizing investors around the world, uh, and as a, an investor myself, I'm allowed to say it, are lazy. And it's, there's a, a paradox in the conveyor belt, which is entrepreneurs are supposed to innovate and break boundaries and create the new and be blah, blah, all the, uh, the disruptive buzzwords. But when raising capital, the pitch deck link needs to look the same. It needs to use the same words so the investor understands and literally, and that's where Endeavor comes in because they teach entrepreneurs how to make that pitch deck and use the right words. So the, uh, entre uh, the investor, irrespective if uh, she comes from Stockholm or, or Silicon Valley, understands how to, to value the company. And this is important to, to adopt that uh, cookie, um, what's it called? Cookie cutter cookie cutter approach to it. And at the same time, find your secret sauce. And, and Didim was approaching it a little, which is, do we as a nation need to have a direction? Is it important that we structurally say, this is what we're good at and create the cluster effect around that in terms of uh, talent, also lowering the risk for local capital to go in, knowing that this is effectively a problem that we collectively want to solve and therefore if we uh, we add all our resources to it and I think many clusters around the, uh, the globe have been successfully successful in that because it creates a, a clearer um, image of where you're going and it's it's more emotional that, than real so I think that the, the region has work to do in telling that story because it's been very much as i was saying earlier a local entrepreneurs building for the local markets taking a global success and making it uh for a local home market with a turkish slant or an arabic slant and now we're seeing different and now is the opportunity probably to tell the a story of something that that you can own don't you agree to them that you can do that now You've taken the steps. Yeah, well, we've seen, I mean, a company such as Insider, Chris knows them well as well. Um, they were born global. They're, they're working on multi-channel optimization for um, online e-commerce, um, digital advertising and customer conversion. They started in Turkey, then they moved their headquarters to Singapore where they got funded by Sequoia. They just received their Series C for almost like 38 million or something like that to enter the US market. So they started here and then they very quickly became, this was a test market and they very quickly went regional and then global. And um, they were born that way. So the company is ex following exactly what you've described. They use Turkey as a test bed, but meanwhile, and this is what I was saying before too, that all of their R&D is still here a lot of their operations are still here because there's a really, really talent, uh, effective talent pool here. Government incentives in terms of R&D spending and, and incentives for tax uh, savings, et cetera. Um, plus, uh, plus the, the, the I, this is the one frustration, I think, opportunity and, uh, and frustration. They're much less expensive. They're, you know, you're paying one sixth the price for a really, really talented senior engineer here as you would be anywhere else. And actually that's also the part of the downfall. I mean, part of the reason why these companies are now looking abroad is because they can't, they, they can test th their activities here, but no, but they can make more money next door. So now all of a sudden they're focusing in terms of sales and marketing 
um, to other re regions. So Chris, I want to bring you in on exactly that point. Is Turkey condemned to be in that place? Is the test bed and then they go other places to make money? Or, or how does Turkey move beyond that? I think it's a very powerful question. First of all, just as a quick aside, listening to Deedham was a reminder to me, because I think I take Endeavor for granted, what an extraordinary visionary group they have been, you know, with Linda Rundberg's co-founding of it. And what Deedham did in Turkey, I, I got to meet her 10 years ago. And it, it makes a difference because um, to your question, there are a couple of things that, that are happening regardless, and then there are things that need to be supported. And what is happening regardless is that there's a, and, and macroeconomists don't really focus on these two things anywhere near as much as they should, right? And the first one is a sense of empowerment. The idea that I in Turkey can see a woman who looks just like me navigating many things that I've had to navigate anywhere in the world, and she's made it work, means that I think that I can make it work. Right. And so, again, bottom up, there's this almost psychological view of, I'm seeing this now from such a broad lens, why not me? And I think that's a, a massive shift that is happening, which is being unleashed. I think the second, uh, less psychological, but more structural, which I think people often us underestimate, is that when these companies do succeed, they've inevitably trained hundreds of people on how to do it. And invariably, they want to spin off and start their own. And so... In America, they used to call it the PayPal effect because PayPal right. became a very large company and it kicked off people like Reid Hoffman and Elon Musk and other folks like that to go off and start their own companies. Well, the, the successes from Yemma, the, the young people from Yemma Septiki, a lot of them have broken off and done companies. I am assured that people from Peak Games will break off and do companies. So all of that is, is there to be unleashed. I think the essence of your question, honestly, Karen, is a, is a top down to the degree that that the regulatory environment or the policy environment or the ability culturally to navigate all the dynamics of Deedham and Aurora described so well gets capped or narrowed, that will narrow people. But talent is, as, as I think the Aurora and then the insider is a great example of this to point out very well, like the talent is global day one. If you are a woman and you want to build something extraordinary and you want to make it big, the only thing that caps you in this day and age is the structure and the culture within you are playing. Uh, and that, to me, is what is so important about having the top down really uh, unleash this and support it, not as kind of a cute sideshow, but a huge dynamism of what is the 21st century economy. Well, and Chris, uh, Aurora, jump in, and then I'm going to follow up on that. Go ahead, Aurora. No, but I think that the follow-on is, uh, is also that you need time as well. Uh, you need time for the local uh, waves of entrepreneurs to make a little money to come back into the system as investors, just as Didim was saying. I remember I was sitting, I interviewed on stage um, uh, Rina Onur, the co-founder of Peak Games in 2014, and she's now with, uh, with the 500 startups and as an investor. And it's not about the money. It's so easy to think that this is a question of capital. And obviously, we need capital in the region, but you need capital that understands tech. Um, she has built a business, and she's now an investor that, that, that knows the difficulty of it. Um, and, and some of the, the, the VCs that are now growing uh, in the space get it. And it's, it's an easy thing to say, but it's, it's actually so important. So important. Yeah, and, and Didem, you know, Chris's comment, well, Aurora, I appreciate that because I'm one of those people who's always thought that the capital has been the key piece of this puzzle, but uh, the way you structured what you said is super helpful. And Didem, Chris's comment reminded me of something you had said in your opening remarks, which is you talked about how Turkey may be burdened by the fact that there's no clear strategic direction. You know, what is the area in which Turkey is going to build that tech muscle? And, you know, is it going to be fintech? Is it going to be gaming? And I just want to ask you to answer your own question. And then, and then I'm going to play the audience, but let me turn it back to you first. I mean, I, I'm not talking about being 100% prescriptive, but it just is, is fascinating to me that there are so many natural competitive advantages that Turkey could have if they wanted to be playing in a global sphere. Uh, in so many ways, in so many applied areas of technology, there are no standards. So today, the playing field is, is equal. Anybody can be the pioneer and jump into the game. Whereas before, when we were dealing with established economies, you know, there was always somebody who had set the standards and, and there were market leaders. But now, there's no clear market leader on solar technology or wind technology or 
there's no clear market leader on on machine learning. Um, all of these, everybody's innovating and we're all innovating at the same time. So there's an opportunity for Turkey to actually be an active, to play an active role in some of these spaces. So for example, I do think that in um, renewable energy, because of just the geographic positioning and it's, um, benefits from wind, wind, water, and solar, uh, solar, and even geothermal opportunities, that there's an opportunity there. Once upon a time, a self-sufficient agriculture country who, who was a major exporter, like we should just be pioneering agro, agropreneurship and ag tech, for example. Um, there's so many, even also in the space of, um, uh, of biotech uh, and and the medical healthcare tourism industry, etc. Like there's a lot that can be done if there is a little bit of just a few north stars placed around. Not necessarily really supremely prescriptive, but I think that there could be some campaigns and policies around it. And and of course, and then that goes back to the education system and what type of talent we're trying to produce. To great pride and excitement. <laughs> Pride, excitement, all of it, sure. And that energy creates an adventure which allows mothers to let their children start, start come working in a startup. And all these small things allow it to happen. And it's usually sounds fluffy, but it is so important. No, that's what I meant about the media being a really important stakeholder in building a local ecosystem, right? When And Chris's book. And this Chris book has all single handedly the put the the whole yeah. region on the market. It makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. Whether it's a book, it's people talking about it uh, around around different communities. Whether it's the news, the print, the online news, etc. Even the film industry having little TV series on startups, etc. Like all of this, making entrepreneurship more accessible and more normative makes a big difference. Well, I would say all three of you were quite compelling evangelists on this point. <laughs> I am now going to go to the audience for questions, and I'm going to start off with one from Casey Mahoney, who asked, how is the Turkish government leveraging opportunities to benefit directly from the human capital and hardware software Turkey's tech sector is producing, particularly in the security military realm? To what extent is Turkish tech independent of the current regime's internal and external security policy? Who wants to take a stab at that? I can take a generic one. Okay, great. So government policy in, in all industries, not just tech, but in all industries, but in tech in particular, tends to be threefold. So the government has government-owned technology enterprises specifically dealing with communications, software development, aerospace, etc. So those are the defense industries, let's say. Then they also have semi, let's call them quasi government nonprofit organizations that deal with innovation, research and development, etc. Like the Tubitox, there's the T3 Foundation. So there's a bunch of different kind of foundation arms um, that deal with, it's like the National Science Institute is Tubitox, that's the equivalent of that. And then the third part is enabling the private sector. So all the infrastructure or all the policy um, that they create around it. So it's threefold. I don't know that any of it is really preventative of any types of collaboration so far. Um, every once in a while you have a little bit of debates about, you know, we should do our own version or we might, you know, we might not allow the such, such and such a company to, to play in Turkey anymore because they're not paying local taxes, et cetera. I mean, that's, those conversations are happening around the world too. So I don't know if it's specifically to Turkey, related to Turkey, but in the defense industries, the defense industries are predominantly spearheaded by um, government owned companies. And then the private sector and the entrepreneurship space collaborates with those organizations. Some people have complained that they feel like that their ideas are going to be kind of usurped, let's say. Um, some entrepreneurs have felt that way. Um, but for the most part, it seems to be open and collaborative from an outsider's point of view. Thanks. Chris, do you have anything, any a different no, perspective? Yeah. No, not at all. I think you, you covered it very well. 
I wish I, had my, I wish I had my colleagues from Concilio here with me because it's their area of, of expertise. And I can just generically say that if you have a technical challenge somewhere and there's enough uh, capital around solving it, uh, innovation will gravitate towards it. Yeah. Maybe, the one, the maybe the one challenge might be is also that when you are doing, when you are participating in government programs or projects, et cetera, the margins tend to be really, really small. So that becomes a frustration for entrepreneurs, I think. So I have a question that's directed to Aurora, but I think Chris and Dita probably can speak to it as well. But Aurora, the question is, as an investor, can you tell us if the general image of a country plays a role in decisions to invest in startups? Yes. <laughs> and as an investor, you, I can tell you, when you meet them, uh, you have to expect that at 99% sure you're going to get a no. So you have to tweak the whole conversation around maybe getting that little yes. And that means addressing every elephant in the room. I, if there's a big company doing something similar, who could buy you the image of your country, the image of everything. And you need to talk about it and address it and show that you have thought about it. And that is how you maybe get a no to a yes. I definitely think that uh, that's, that's absolutely true. And everybody's playing for that little teeny tiny 1% actually. And if you don't get funding, it's not the end of the world, I think, as well. If you're so, such few companies actually do get funding, like from third parties, that entrepreneurs should also be able to grow organically if they have to for a certain time. And it's not a just because you've gotten funding doesn't mean that you'll succeed. And just because you didn't get funding doesn't mean you'll fail. And that's also part of the mindset, too, perhaps. But this related is, to all this is me. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, go ahead, jump in. But this is the media also about the theater, the theater about getting venture capital is that is the, the stamp of approval of success. But in reality, you've taken a huge loan or you're giving away a big chunk of your company. So it's also not portrayed at, uh, in the right way. So if you can build it yourself, that's obviously much cooler and hold the control of your company. Yeah, so there's that too. But I will also say that I do think that countries have their own image and their own reputation. And that does create a premium on the brands that come from that country. And the brands that come from the country also contribute to the, to the brand of the country itself, right? So there's a circular um, reference there. So say for example, when I say Italy in design, everybody, there's, there's a, Italy, if I'm a design company from Italy, all of a sudden I have a premium. Or if I say uh, engineering in Germany, all of a sudden I have a premium. So what is Turkey known for is what my question is about competitive strategy, actually. Because if, as a country, we're known for something, then it will also create a premium on the type of startups that are coming out from this country. And Chris, so quick, yeah, on. just yeah, a very quick thing to ask. I mean, uh, there's the image, and then there's a reality, and then there's a perception of where things may be changing. And as an investor, I think about all of that. The image, per se, is not irrelevant to me. And I think the other observations that uh, Dietam and Rora made are true. But what I'm really thinking, what real, you know, what investors are really thinking from really at its essence is, am I putting money into an entrepreneur and into a place where I think I can be more successful than I can do it somewhere else, point one. Point two, are the market dynamics such that a great entrepreneur, she will build something extraordinary there and I wanna be part of that. But do I perceive that the government will in any way cap her ability to succeed Will the government someday take the money once they become large or start putting uh, constraints on it? That I think a great deal about. And then are they shifting? Are things in motion? Because today's image isn't necessarily what five years from now image is going to be. And so one of the things that I often do when I think about that question is really get to the essence. Can I get investment into a great you know, entrepreneur? Will she be, have the ability within that context, whatever the image is, to make it succeed? And are the trends in a way that in the end, I can get my investor's money out in a very, very successful way. Um, because generally speaking, when there's an image about something, I actually start thinking about what the counter image is. Because if everyone says Turkey is a, a place I shouldn't go, that's the exact moment I'm thinking, well, maybe Turkey is a place I should look at again. So yes. that's how I kind of navigate the image part. Very interesting. There's and I love how you refer to entrepreneurs as she. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so 
there's a question that's coming from Kadri Tastin that actually follows quite nicely from this, and it's the interaction of what's happening inside of a country with external trends. And so the question is, actually it's directed to you, Didem. You said that the Turkish startup market began in 2003 and 2004. Coincidentally, those are also the golden years of Turkey-EU relations as Turkey was moving towards starting accession negotiations with the European Union. Do you see a relationship? That first, the, in the 2000s, from 2000 to 2010, that was definitely a golden period for Turkey. I think it was Turkey on the rise as a hipster destination, just as an up and coming talent pool, leapfrogging technologies, a lot of things were happening. It was really an interesting time. And, and I think that even for Endeavor coming into Turkey at that moment, it was just opportune. All the stars were aligned. I don't know. I mean, since then, there have been many, many, many different challenges. So um, that era that we lived in, just like the, the all the stars were aligned, that era that, that those 10 years were, were very special, I think, actually. And since then, it's become a little bit more complicated, just less, less transparent, more opaque. And then Chris, it was this upward trend, yeah. Chris, or if you want to jump in on this, feel free. Well, it just, there's a friend of mine who Dita knows very well, who's one of the truly great venture capitalists and great human beings and ecosystem builders of Turkey, who once said to me, he said, you know, in those golden years, everyone thought Turkey was going to be the China of Europe. And now everyone thinks that Turkey might be the next Syria. And he said, pendulum swing. And that's why the, your perception question was so important, because the fact is neither was ever true. And so the question really becomes now, okay, what are the policy making happen? What are the signals that Turkey is sending to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world? Is this a place where, in fact, people want to unleash all kinds of economic potential in real terms? And if the answer to that question is yes, then this is going to be a very interesting period for Turkey. If the question remains unanswered or people begin no, why wouldn't investors in Europe go to elsewhere in Europe? Why wouldn't they go to Asia or Southeast Asia or Latin America or America? And that's the, the challenge and opportunity, I think, in this period right now. And the answer, at least from my lens, is it's, it's really quite unclear. Well, I, I might jump in just really quickly that the entrepreneurial ecosystem has developed enough of a critical mass that they've started to self-organize, right? So they themselves are doing a little bit of agenda setting amongst themselves. Um, both as entrepreneurs, as entrepreneur springboards, and also as investors. So that's one thing. And the second thing too, we're seeing more and more um, born global companies coming up. So they're not necessarily just focused on Turkey. They're really focused on the global market. And then the third component, there was a third piece. I just forgot what I was going to say. But, but Didem, I hear this from investors all the time. Oh, the I would love to invest in a Turkish entrepreneur. Just let me know once they've left Turkey. The third like, that's, thing, a yeah. that's a problem. That's the problem. And then the third thing is that verticals. We've really gotten, it used to just be about entrepreneurship in general. The entrepreneurs themselves have started organizing around verticals. So they're becoming more sophisticated and deeper. Um, but you're absolutely right. Just in the, in the first half of 2020, for example, 59 companies received something like $81 million in investment. But I think like nine companies that left Turkey also received something exactly. like $50 million in investment, right? So the companies that are leaving are, are doing different things. You're right. But there's, there's an important point to be used by an institution like uh, uh, Endeavor, which is creating a positive circle around the diaspora. Um, so it's not only they've left or they are leaving and that's when you access money, but you can really, and, and several countries in the region have created a successful uh, story, a story and circle where capital and talent uh, goes in and out. Goes in and out, yeah. So there's a question that's going to allow me to dig a little bit deeper on a point Chris just made. You know, Chris's comment that you both have followed up on about the investor saying, oh, I'd love to invest in that Turkish entrepreneur. Let me know when he's left Turkey or she's left Turkey. Um, and we have a question from Tobin Nelson that's asking or first saying Turkey's regulatory environment is increasingly hostile to tech firms. 
and the references to social media law, digital services tax, data localization. So looking at some of the very specific factors that might be inhibiting that investment. So the question is, does this not scare away potential investors? So let's focus a little bit on the regulatory environment that's at play in Turkey. Who wants to jump in on that? Didem, you have to start. You have to start. I have, a, I have an opinion. I have an opinion on it. It's not like, um, it's my personal opinion. I think that a lot of the 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 reactions of Turkish government towards tech companies today are not much different than the conversations that governments around the world are having. So whether it's you know, fake news or perpetuation of hate speech or um, taxation. You know, you're 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 delivering a, a good or a service, and where are you being taxed? Like those type of things, taxation, um, ethics, art. You know, ethics and in artificial intelligence, ethics and in, in machine learning, ethics and in, in data security and privacy and everything. So. A lot of those things are the same conversations that people are having, that governments are having around the world. I don't know that Turkey is necessarily extraordinarily sensitive. In the one, the one area, of course, that might differ, or that does differ, is censorship, right? So censorship is one thing. Um, but on the, all the other topics, I think that they're kind of at par, at par with what's being discussed around the world except with the exception of censorship, I think that we are very sensitive related to censorship. Aurora, I know you want to get in. But if I think, if I have my investor's hat on, and I know meeting entrepreneurs day in and day out, uh, listening to pitches uh, around how they're going to build a business, when you have a global perspective as an investor, you know that the team in front of you are solving a problem that 10 companies in Munich, 10 companies in Stockholm, 10 companies in Damascus, 10 companies in Johannesburg are trying to solve the same problem. So it's not about the, the opportunity of the problem. Is it the, the team in front of me? Do they have what it takes to make this a success? Uh, and going back to Didem's point, that there's challenges in every market. And going back to my point, which is you have a no in front of you that you're going to turn into a yes. And you have to address everything. And you have to showcase that you are the team that, uh, that works with these bottlenecks or with, the, with these structural challenges as an opportunity. Your mindset is to make these problems work for you. And you're that type of person, or you've built a team that does it in that type of way. That's when the investor goes, ah, she's got it. Yeah. I mean, I, the only thing I would, I would sort of say, maybe mildly different on that is I think that I mean, Aurora's last point is exactly right. Because every country, particularly in all the rising markets I'm in, have amazing regulatory and structural infrastructure challenges, and an entrepreneur can address it. But at the same time, if that entrepreneur is running with massive ankle weights, uh, it's a problem. And there, there are unusual models out there that I'm watching. I can't tell if the jury is out. But, you know, fintech to me is one of the most interesting opportunities because everybody wins. Right, the entrepreneurs can win, uh, uh, investors can win, but more importantly, society wins because all of a sudden people who never had access to a bank have access to a bank. People had difficulty getting credit because banks didn't want to lend to them. With data, you can actually lend to these people without credit scoring. The governments benefit because the people are unleashed to buy more goods and to transact more safety, safely. There's less crime. They can collect more taxes. It's one of these things that can be a win-win, and yet. Um, it's still slow in being unleashed because sometimes they're protecting legacy business, what have you. But oddly, Brazil and Indonesia are two countries whose regulators are meeting regularly with entrepreneurs and investors and policymakers um, to try to figure out how they can actually create a regulatory environment, not to modernize banking, but literally fintech as a thing in its own right. Yes. And I think when governments start to step into the game and say, we're not just trying to make something into a train or into an airplane, or something we already know, but there's something new that's being unleashed here that we have to think about what we can do, not only to protect citizens, but to also unleash this opportunity. Then you're unleashing not only an opportunity within a country, you are creating entrepreneurs who will be global. And I'm not sure I see that out of, uh, out of Ankara yet. Not out of Ankara yet, but I literally, just before this call, I was talking to the Istanbul Financial Center, which was set up by the presidential office, actually. Um, 
by 2023, they have a big agenda and they just started I mean, I'm pretty impressed actually. They just started really talking to all these different stakeholders and they're trying to get those inputs. Um, it seems That's like awesome. it's an organized effort I, and they themselves have admitted that they've fallen behind, um, but they do have an incentive or an, an intention actually, an intention to speed things up over the next six months even. That's what it sounded like today. So I was pretty impressed at when I got out of that meeting that that they, were that they were taking the time to talk to the right people, um, that they were taking the time to talk to a diversified group of people, um, and that they really were, they were really structuring, uh, trying to align everyone around common goals, which was nice. See, this is, this is incredibly encouraging because Aurora said something earlier, which was true in the last 10 years, and I'm not sure it's true in the next 10 years, that these rising ecosystems and com startup communities take time. And the, the power of technology being everywhere and the power of acceleration and COVID and new technology is all the exciting things. But what it means is that people now who move too slowly might be left behind for good because there's so many things that are being created elsewhere. So Dita, I'm sharing that story, but not only the story of what they're doing and how they're doing it, but the fact that they want to hit it quickly is yeah. really very encouraging. Yeah, I was encouraged today too. I mean, it was impressive because we were all, everybody was frustrated around the same things. And then um, the fact that they've just started this dialogue was impressive. Yeah. But Chris, that point that you need speed, you need scale in this COVID moment, does that actually give an edge to the big players, to the American companies, the Chinese companies? Does that make it harder for those bottom-up startups to It's a fantastic. It is a fantastic question, and I really have wrestled this particularly in China, for example, where there are these juggernauts that effectively not only own, say, fintech, but they're, they've merged in these super apps, fintech and video experiences and uh, e-commerce and all. And you sort of say to yourself, how does an innovator compete? And yet in the midst of all of this, there's always white space. There's always people who are able to find something. I mean, TikTok should never have happened and it became a global juggernaut using China as the analogy. There's a company there no one has ever heard of called Pintadu which is literally worth like $30 billion, which is an e-commerce company that simply passed Alibaba for dealing in different kinds of products and in, in kind of third, fourth, and fifth tier cities. And so as, as both Diem and Aurora have said consistently here, great entrepreneurs are always finding that kind of space where they can move very quickly as, as uh, you know, behaviors um, you know, uh, change. I think having said that, scale matters because at the end of the day, people feel safe in it. There's a lot more capital available. There's a ton more data that allows them to launch other products in very powerful ways. Um, and so to me, the counter of that is the Turkish entrepreneurs have data that most of the juggernauts will never have. That is an advantage that they can build to not only strengthen their position and what they're trying to build, but they can use that expertise as they go into other markets. Um, and so I don't think it's the death of it by any stretch of the imagination, but I think the pressure of size and what Reid Hoffman calls blitz-scaled companies um, certainly is a dynamic that will have pressure on innovation in a way that, that I might not have said if we had this conversation a few years ago. I'm now going to combine two questions that have come in because they're both industry specific. So we have one person who's interested in the state of Turkey's semiconductor industry and is curious about whether that is still mostly military driven R&D or is it diversifying? And the other person is interested in Turkey's cybersecurity industry and whether those projects are primarily state-driven or startup-driven. So those are quite specific, but if anybody has thoughts on semiconductors or cybersecurity, please, yeah, Didam, you're leaning forward, so let me go to you. I'm leaning forward to hear you better. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, semiconductors is both semiconductors and cybersecurity, I would say on both fronts, the defense industries have their own initiatives and the private sector entrepreneurs are also moving forward pretty quickly. You also see a lot of um, both semiconductor and semiconductor, you see a lot of Turkish European collaborations, like so startups that are based, that have a, a foot in both places. And for cybersecurity, we're seeing a lot of companies that are both in Turkey and in the United States, right? So they have a foot in a, a foothold in both places. Um, 
when I say a lot of companies, any comp any segment that has more than let's say 60 startups uh, pursuing activity to me is is a critical mass, which is in, enough for a vertical to emerge. Um, so there aren't thousands of them, but there, there's a significant handful. Great. And I am now going to use my remaining time to ask one of my questions as a last question for us to conclude on. And I'm very interested in asking each of you, what would you say is the single most important factor to Turkey's tech ecosystem remaining vibrant? So just one thing, what's the most important thing? And Chris, we'll start with you. Let's go Chris Aurora Didem. So Chris, you go first. Yeah, I mean, Didem will have the, the right answer to that. I think it is merely a conscious understanding, bottom up and top down, that this is not a cute sideshow but in fact has ramifications not only in the future of 21st century company development, but every company is a tech company now. All the skills, all the understanding of everything we've talked about in the last 45 minutes or an hour is true for every company in Turkey. And so people think of this as a ribbon cutting exercise or something nice, they can't do that. The biggest thing for me is for people to take this as one of their, one of their top economic priorities um, in what they do. Okay, Aurora. Uh, I'd say um, because many of the the actual factual uh, building blocks of an ecosystem are there, um, and as we discussed, some of the infrastructure pieces are, might not be to the advantage, but as an entrepreneur, you make it to your advantage in how you tell your story. I'd say one of the key elements in building a, 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 a strong, vibrant, or keeping on to that is is holding on to the pride and excitement, the adventure part of it, and creating that, the positive energy that allows all the factual hard facts to, to work in your advantage. And that organizations like yourselves highlight uh, the market, allowing uh, foreign capital to come in and see the, the financial opportunity. Mm -hmm. Tidem. Such a loaded question. One thing I might have to say is collaboration. Um, I, I see it happening already, which is wonderful. Endeavor was all about collaboration, like bringing together stakeholders so that we could uh, align around common goals and objectives. That just needs to continue and it needs to multiply. It needs to have a snowballing effect because if you're gonna be in FinTech and lobby for regulatory reform, one company lobbying by itself is something, but 60 startups lobbying together is something else. So. I think that there just needs to be a collaborated, collaborative effort on a lot of things and collaboration on, between entrepreneurs to promote the regulatory reforms, et cetera, that they need, but also collaboration between established companies and entrepreneurs rather than trying to suffocate the entrepreneur. Like, I think that uh, actually it was um, Fadi Gandur from, from WAMDA who had said, there should be a concept called corporate social corporate entrepreneurship responsibility. So similar to corporate social responsibility, which is for established companies, they should have an index as, as to how many entrepreneurs they're actually supporting with as their first clients or as their clients and, and really trying to create um, opportunities for the entrepreneurs to grow rather than suffocating them. Well, fantastic. I wanna give an enormous thank you to all three of you. Uh, when I was asked to moderate this, I was really excited to do it because I knew I would learn a lot from the three of you. And we have more than achieved that. I feel so much smarter about what's happening in Turkey on tech, but also more broadly. What I wasn't expecting and what I'm taking away from this conversation is also inspiration because the power of startups and the power of an idea to create something new and people believing in that idea and the cooperation it takes to see it happen and making a positive difference in our world came through so vibrantly in the conversation. So a very sincere thank you to Chris, to Didem, to Aurora. Appreciate the time, appreciate your insights and thank you for helping us highlight this aspect of what's happening in Turkey in 2020. So thank you. And thank you to all of you who joined us and listened in and sent in such terrific questions. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks thank again. You. Thank you.
Lovely. Thank you.